Hey everybody, thanks for checking out the channel. Which way should a shock be mounted? Fat side up or skinny side up? I've heard a few explanations, some correct, some less correct. In this video, we'll get to the truth about what works and what doesn't matter. On this channel, we look at the science behind your grown-up toys. The answer to the great shock orientation debate is, it depends. Are you driving fast or crawling? The answers are totally different. The main purpose of suspension on any vehicle is to maintain tire contact with the terrain for traction, although jumping's okay too. If you drive fast, your priority is absorbing bumps to maintain traction. If you're an RC crawler running slowly, then your goal is articulation to maintain traction. This is why I love RC crawlers. Traditional bump absorbing shock tuning doesn't really apply. If you need to soak up bumps, speeding between gates at a competition or something, your big, soft, squishy tires are going to handle most of the bump management long before your suspension does. Good reason number one, clearance. If your shock only fits one way, then there's your answer. You really don't have a lot of options. This is pretty common on extremely custom crawlers. Your shock might only fit one way or the other. I really like these Traxxas caps on DravTech shocks. They're really short, shorter than the stock ones, almost as short as the offset caps that DravTech sells. But the problem is they often don't have enough articulation for what I'm doing. So I almost never use these caps, even though they're my favorite. I'm pretty much always using the stock rod ends or the offset caps. Be sure to check for shock clearance at all positions of articulation and steering. Very good reason number two, unsprung weight. Your sprung weight is all the mass above the shocks sitting on the springs. Your unsprung weight is all the mass below the shocks, axles, wheels, and about half the mass of the links and the shocks. If you have a fast moving vehicle, you want your suspension to react quickly. The less moving weight, the better, because it means your suspension can be pushed out of the way more easily and recover more quickly. Also, you want your sprung to unsprung weight ratio to be really high, meaning light wheels, heavy chassis, so that your wheels react, but your body remains stable. But since you also want your total vehicle weight as light as possible for speed and acceleration, reducing your unsprung weight becomes even more critical. So every gram helps. You want your chassis to be big and heavy like a Cadillac and your wheels to just flutter underneath. Fast-moving vehicles should have as much of their weight as possible on the chassis, the sprung weight, so that the unsprung weight is as light as possible. RC crawlers are the exact opposite. You want as much weight off the chassis and on to the axle, ideally the front axle. Good reason number three, lower center of gravity. On a rock crawler, low center of gravity is paramount. Installing your shocks upside down, as many would describe it, theoretically should put your weight lower. But is there enough weight in the shocks to actually make a difference? Let's check it out. We're going to figure out where the center of gravity is for uh, these different length shocks. I currently work at a robotics company and I borrowed this extremely accurate scale. It measures down to one thousandth of a gram. To get that accuracy, the weights have to take place inside this glass container so that any temperature or wind influence that might be blowing past the measurement uh, doesn't affect the, the reading. So I'm going to weigh each shock this way, 
then this way. And then we'll weigh this shock in total to get a baseline calibration number. Here are all the measurements I collected and something became immediately clear. I'm going to jump right to the conclusion because no detailed analysis of these numbers is needed. These are pretty typical 10th scale RC shocks in size and shape. The shock weight is about 14 to 16 grams. The difference in weight from one end to the other is less than 2 grams. The difference between extended and compressed is less than 1 gram. Let's take a maximum case and say it's a 2 gram difference between one end and the other. You've got 4 shocks, so 8 grams total. Suppose your car is 2,500 grams. That's only one third of a percent of your total car weight. That's not much. Let's look at it another way. Consider the center of gravity of the shock only. It shifts less than 5% in the very best case. If you have a 15 gram shock, that's less than a one gram shift up or down. Even the shocks with offset caps, they look like they have a lot of weight on this end, but it wasn't enough to make any significant difference in the center of gravity. As you can see, the actual difference in CG is negligible. Do I still run my shocks with the fat side down? Heck yes. Even though the engineer in me knows it probably doesn't make a difference on the rocks, it is theoretically better and I just feel better about it. I'm going to change this from good reason number three to bad reason number one. Lower center of gravity, there just isn't enough mass to make a difference. Here are a few other reasons I've heard that are not so correct. Bad reason number two, oil leaks. If your shocks are leaking oil and only gravity will keep the oil in, you need to start by getting a higher quality shock and building it correctly. Otherwise, I can't help you. Just go. Just leave. Come back when you've got your life together. There is a big difference between weeping and leaking. Having a small amount of oil buildup at the seal is normal and preferred. You want to keep the seals lubricated, which means there should be oil or grease on the backside of them. If you get a little oil residue on the outside, just wipe it off. If you're getting consistent heavy buildup or even full drops of oil on the outside of your shocks, you've likely got damaged or worn seals or perhaps even an incorrect assembly. Here is the smartest way to build a shock to eliminate oil leaks. I've never seen anybody teach or build a shock this way. I'm sure you will correct me in the comments if I'm mistaken. But first, here is an O-ring lesson that shows why my method works. When you're designing an O-ring groove, also called a gland, this is the pocket that the O-ring sits in. There should be clearance for the O-ring side to side or up and down on a vertical shock. This clearance is to allow the O-ring to expand as it compresses. Plus, there's a little extra room for a margin of error. This image came right off of an O-ring website. If the O-ring is touching on three sides, then the groove is too tight. O-rings are designed to be compressed around the diameter and not along the axis. Now I'm sure we've all assembled shocks this way before and it probably worked out fine most of the time. But why risk damaging your seals when there's a smarter way that's just as easy? Don't scrape sharp piston threads over a compressed O-ring. It only takes once to regret doing it the wrong way. Try it this way instead. Here is the smartest way, in my opinion, to build most RC car shocks. Start by putting your piston through the body first, not last. Then we're going to build up the seal stack. And you'll see how easily these go on. You're not damaging the O-ring or the quad ring as it goes over the threads. Then once you have it together, push it all into place. You can push it in with some pliers 
or with flat nose wrench, something like that. Before you slide the seal stack into the shock body, be sure to load it up with some good shock grease. I didn't do it in this video because I wanted to focus more on the assembly and keep it simple. Then, of course, the funnest part of all in this shock is putting in the circlip. Helps to have good pliers. These Nipex pliers are probably the best there are best there are, especially for this size. And I use Nipex pliers um, as often as I can. Made in Germany, they're really, really high quality. I'll put some links in the description and if you choose to shop with those links, you'll be sticking it to the man because Amazon will share a commission with the channel. You may only get one side in, which is fine. Just come back and push the other side in. Now, I've got a super buttery seal and I did not damage the seals by pushing the threads through them. You may also find that a lot of rebuild kits come with other washers. You don't really need those, Especially in this draft tech, I've seen it cause more problems than not. I just leave that out because you shouldn't have to compress your whole seal stack when you're putting it in. It should slide together easily and the clip should go right on and it'll be super smooth. If it's tight and you have to force it together, then you probably have too tall of a stack and you probably have too many spacers or too thick of spacers in that location. Bad reason number three, air bubbles. If there are air bubbles in your oil, they will float to the top. And I've heard the argument that you can keep your piston out of the bubbles if your shock is oriented like this. If you run full droop, it's the opposite. However, build your shocks correctly, you should not have air bubbles in your oil under any circumstance. When you don't have air bubbles, you don't need to worry about which end is up. If you have air bubbles in your oil, uh, get out of here, I can't take it. Just go, I can't take it, come back when you've got your shock built correctly. Get your life together, come back and visit. There is something called an emulsion shock where it's designed to work with oil that's foamy with air bubbles. They are generally considered lower end and the performance is less predictable. Especially on a small RC car, the bubbles and air molecules are quite big relative to the size of the shock. You can get away with it on a full-size motorcycle, for example, but I'm not sure why you would go that path on an RC car when bladder shocks are available and are just as simple. But there are pro racers that pick emulsion over bladders, so go figure. Tangent reason number four. This isn't directly related to shock orientation, but this is a good video to mention it. One thing I occasionally hear is that you want oil on both sides of the piston, and that certainly is a good idea in theory. I've seen some people put an extra spacer underneath the piston head with the premise that it keeps oil on both sides of the piston. I like the concept of having plenty of oil to draw from on both sides, but most shocks are going to have a circlip underneath the piston anyway, which acts as a spacer and keeps your piston in the oil. So additional spacers aren't really needed, but it doesn't hurt. More importantly is to realize that if you add spacers here, it's going to shorten your overall shock length and reduce your travel. So don't just add a spacer indiscriminately. Also, your car doesn't spend much time completely topped out, so your piston spends most of its life in the mid-stroke or deeper, which keeps it plenty deep into the oil. I'm not really a fan of this technique, but it doesn't hurt so long as you want a shorter shock with less travel. So what did we learn? Make sure your shocks have clearance at full steering lock and articulation. Fat side up if you're going fast. For crawlers, there's not big enough difference in CG to matter. And please build your shocks correctly. Take care, everybody.